this is Ed Overstreet and welcome to the Night Sky Imaging uh, uh, YouTube channel. Um, there's a little bit of confusion um, about what I'm doing. I, I saw where the, uh, uh, the feature says that uh, we're going to be doing some solar imaging. Well, that's not going to happen, but I did some solar imaging this morning and uh, somehow or another uh, uh, between YouTube and Facebook because I'm simulcasting this to both YouTube and Facebook at the same time and so uh, at any rate we're going to be uh, imaging the Orion Nebula if everything works out so with that being said let's head over to our telescopes and let me share my screen and we'll start with uh, this kit. This is um, the laptop called Astro One and it's connected to, I'll show you, let's go outside to our surveillance cameras and this first telescope which you should see now, this first telescope is uh, Astro One. This is Astro Two. Now on this platform covered with a towel are two laptops. One laptop is called Astro 1 and the other is called Astro 2. That will help me keep uh, these two telescopes apart and, uh, and, and I'll know therefore uh, what I'm doing with each one. It does get confusing. Okay, let's go back to our uh, sequence generator pro software i've already started cooling the camera to minus 20 degrees uh, we're going to be imaging m42 and that an image of m42 uh, was used uh, at the opening of this video so that's what that should look like now let's head over to the other kit and we'll be imaging NGC uh, 2023, which is also IC 434, and it's the Horsehead Nebula. And it's also located in uh, the area of, uh, I'll show you it real quick. Uh, we'll bring up our planetarium software, and I gotta move some things out of the way. And let's go ahead and find NGC 2023, and it's right here. It may be easier to see this if we go to the big planetarium software. It is. Um, zoom in. Okay. This is the Horsehead area, NGC 2023. And we're going to be imaging this with one telescope. And we're going to be imaging this with the second telescope. But they're uh, all part of this very rich area of nebulosity in the uh, Orion uh, region. So that's our goal tonight. Uh, currently, we are at about uh, 28 degrees altitude. And normally I do not image until I'm about 35 degrees altitude. But the moon is over here uh, and it's going to be chasing me all night long. So I wanna go ahead and get started and get some data coming in before the uh, noon rise, moon rises too high and starts calling, cost, cost, causing some uh, issues with my images. So let's go back over here and zoom out and I'll show you a little more. Uh, there's the moon and it's gonna follow this track this yellow line and uh, 
and head over uh, uh, to this other side, uh, uh, settle in the west. But uh, it's going to uh, be somewhere, oh, in about the 50 degree uh, mark. And when it is, it's going to throw so much light out, it's going to mess with my LRGB images. So I want to get as much as I can while I can. So let's go back to our imaging software and let's go ahead and take Astro 1 and let's slew to our target and bring up our software. I mean our surveillance camera and watch the telescope head in that direction hopefully I'm having a hard time talking tonight I've got some feedback in these uh, headphones I'm using a different set of headphones and not too sure it's gonna work out okay We've got uh, to center now, which uh, will create a plate solving routine. Plate solving involves nothing more than centering the target within a few pixels of, of uh, center. That way, if I want to image the same target tomorrow night, I can go back to the exact same place, pixel on pixel. So there's the Orion Nebula, and it's not centered, so it's actually 651 pixels off in right ascension and 289 pixels off in declination. It should get it right now. Hi, Delinda. Glad you're on board. Okay, we are still off. I like to uh, get within a 50 pixel margin, and we're 10 degrees off in right ascension. We're 62, not degrees, 62 pixels off in declination. Kind of looks like it's centered, but we're going to do better than that. Okay, we're one pixel off of dead center in right ascension, two pixels off in uh, declination. So let's bring up our guiding software, and we've already connected the gear. So let's close that. Let's start looping. And that brings up some stars, and let's locate a guide scar and let's start guiding and we'll take a look at our graph early on and see how it's going it takes a few minutes for your guiding to settle down we're right now running under 1.0 RMA RMS at 1.18 we had a bump okay let's go back to our we don't want to go outside let's go back to our sequence and let's go ahead and start actually we better run a focusing routine so I'm going to click on run and what is about to happen is the uh, telescope's electronic focuser, which is located uh, at, attached to the uh, telescope, is going to rack the, the telescope focuser or the camera back about 300 steps. So it's just like defocusing the telescope 300 steps then it's going to move in about 70 steps at a time and take a picture 
and see if it starts to improve. See if the stars get tighter. And then it's going to take another picture and move in another 70 steps. And it's going to continue to do that until it reaches what it feels like is the um, proper focus. Then it's going to start racking in the other direction, defocusing as it goes. There will be a, a V created and when and now it's going to start going in the other direction. It's recommending that I set the focuser at 9,882 steps and I'll have a 1.4 half flux radius. Now the uh, uh, focuser is racking in the other direction and it'll start creating this V curve and where these two lines intersect when it's finished will be the uh, peak focusing point and it will set my focuser to that point. Now one of the uh, strange things that's very predictable with imaging is that as the temperature changes outside the uh, focus is sometimes lost and that's not a good thing so you have to refocus from time to time and I have this set up to refocus each time there's a two per percent uh, temperature or two degree temperature change so that's what we'll be doing all right it has established uh, 9856 and it set the focuser at 9856 with a 95 percent quality rating so that's fine I'm good with that so now we're ready to start imaging so uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to take luminosity images I put a there will be a filter uh, it's a clear filter and I'm going to take 15 second exposures and I plan to take a hundred of them then I'm going to take uh, 145 second exposures with the red filter on and then 45 uh, second exposures with the green filter on same with the blue and all in all I'll have 400 frames pictures and they'll all be stacked together ultimately to create a color image and so now we need to move over to the other telescope and get it started let me go back one more time uh, we're going to run the sequence it's going to uh, re-slew to the target because it may have drifted some while I was running the focuser. I have this uh, set up in the camera profile setting to stop guiding when I'm running the focus. And during that time, uh, the, cam the, the telescope may drift some. So we're going to plate solve again and once it has a uh, error-free uh, solve, uh, we'll start imaging. It'll start the guider back up, and it's done so. We are centered, as you can see, and it's down here on this green line. It says resuming the auto guider. It's setting the right distance and we are starting our first image we'll take a look at it then we'll head over and run the other one so astro one is off and running it's downloading the first image and that's what she looks like that's a 15 second image we can uh, stretch it a little more we can stretch it even a little more that's too much stretch it like this and we can zoom up a little bit and that's kind of what the Orion Nebula will ultimately look like there's some nice nebulosity up here a lot of nebulos nebulosity there and so we're 
we're on the right track let's go back to fit the screen and let's head over to the other scope this is my planetarium software and let's uh, slew to our target let's bring up our surveillance yep and surveillance software and let's watch it do that and it's off and running as soon as it stops we'll plate solve and center here is plate solving it's going to essentially do the exact same thing the other kit did We're 105 pixels off in RA 293 in deck. We're now centered. We're six pixels off in uh, RA and one pixel off in declination. I'm good with that. We don't need to run it again. Let's go over to our guiding and make sure we got everything connect connected. Let's start looping. Let's find a star. We lost connection to the camera. I was running to a problems earlier. I may have to go outside and change. Let's try again. Fortunately we started guiding, but I may have to go change the USB cable. I keep my gear out year-round 365 days a year. I have them both uh, tele all th I have three telescopes actually outside and I keep them um, covered with telegismos but uh, they do these uh, cables do uh, malfunction they don't last uh, as long as you would think and I think being outside uh, has a lot to do with that okay we're often guiding uh, doesn't look that great, but it needs some time also to level off, work out some kinks. All right, let's go back and run our focuser. And this is a one-shot color camera. And I have a, um, uh, a, a, a special filter attached to it that's going to require that I image a lot longer or, or I take longer exposures so this is going to be a little longer process actually I don't need this any longer so I can log out of my surveillance cameras and it won't bother me every uh, five minutes Oh, this is the wrong direction. The next one should really take a dive. There you go. <clears throat> Oh, 
while this is running its routine, we can head back over and check with um, this kit. Uh, we've already taken 12, 15 second images. All in all, uh, this will run four hours. It will take four hours to uh, gather these uh, 400 images. Four hours remaining, seven hours passed. I'm kind of wondering where the moon is going to be in four hours, so let's find out. Let me go back to this software and let's uh, take the time and let's go to it's nine o'clock now so let's go to 1 a.m. which is four hours and see how high the moon will be there's the moon there so it, it's going to be a threat and here's Orion area right here and there's the moon so I'm not so entirely sure my uh, images taken the last hour or two are really going to be all that good. They may have to be retaken. But the fun is in doing this, so we'll just check it out, find out. All right, let's go back to uh, see how the routine is running. Uh, it's not going good. Um, probably going to start this all over again. If it doesn't go way up here real quick, well, it's that's going to automatically start it again. I'm already anticipating that uh, the data that I'm going to take tonight, since it's LRGB, is going to be uh, impacted by the moon in such a way that I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to worry about getting this focus exact. So if it doesn't uh, solve it, uh, now, then I'm just going to go ahead and cancel and start imaging. We'll take a look at the uh, half flux radius of the stars and see if uh, they are tolerable. We'll just use the last focus that uh, was used when I imaged. It won't be that far off. So far, it's headed in the right direction. Again, this focus routine involves uh, adjusting the focus back three to four hundred steps. I forget how far back it goes, but it's three or four hundred steps, and it really defocuses the image, and then it takes one, and that's this image right here. And then it moves in about 80 steps closer to the focus point and takes another image. And it evaluates the size of the stars. Then it goes in another 80 steps and takes another image. So this is graph of the uh, half flux radius. It's a way that we measure star size. And so it's going down, and the smaller, the better. So right now, it's recommending a step uh, adjustment to 12,907 steps with a half flux radius of 1.7, which is good for this camera, with a quality of 100%. Uh, now, it's uh, going back in the other direction and it's recommending a position of 12,907. And it'll change again until it uh, 
knows where these two lines are going to intersect at which the focus point should be for uh oh <laughs> we had an issue uh so i don't it may not solve it at all the filter that i have on this camera is causing it you'll notice there's just not that many stars being used i could probably uh, increase the exposure time to create more stars but I don't know well it it, it went sizably uh, north so uh, that's a good sign with a quality rating of 90 percent it's just so so we'll see this next one should be defocused and uh, yeah that's a, we could probably live with this. Uh, we're getting into the 94% quality rating. So it's taken a validation exposure. It's reset the focuser to 12889, which is the uh, position here with a 2.2 uh, HFR. By the way, the scene conditions, so it did solve, the scene conditions are awful tonight. And well, um, they're not awful, they're just not great. Okay, we're ready to uh, start running the sequence. So we're going to click on run. So we're gonna slew to the target again, just like we did last time. And plates off. So it's doing that now. It's going to resolve, then it's going to start the guider, and then it will start taking image. And it's doing this all in its own. I'm sitting here watching this just like you. Biting my nails. Not because I'm worried about it, but because I got something it needs biting. See how we uh, slipped in declination? We're 409 pixels off. I don't remember what we were when we solved it the first time. RA is not that far off, but in declination, we had some drift. That's polar alignment. Okay, we have solved. It's now resuming the auto guider, you see down here. And as soon as it gets it settled, it's evaluating the, the auto guide. Oh, Lordy, let's clear this out and see what's going on. It won't run anything if we don't figure that out. Let me, uh, Run this down to one second. Gracious, what's going on? It ran a dither, but that shouldn't have caused that. Let's clear it out. Clear this out. Clear this out. And let's let it settle down some. If it doesn't settle down, then I will recalibrate this. That's better. We're running under one RMS. just needed a little time to uh, settle okay we should uh, we should be imaging now so we're downloading our first image and this is what she looks like we'll do uh, uh, you can't see much it's gonna take this is just a 15 second image 
and let me tell you what I'm doing. Um, this 15 second image is a massive underexposure and I'm underexposing, actually I want to change this to uh, 120 seconds and I want to do 50 of those. Uh, let's do 75. Okay. Uh, this is a one-shot color camera, so there are no uh, filters involved other than the filter that is attached to the camera, which is designed to uh, combat the moon's light, and uh, we'll see. But I am underexposing uh, on purpose, so you're not going to see too much, if any detail, but it's there. I'm going to try to do a high stretch, and you can't see it, but there's some nebulosity right in here and there. And when I put these images together, uh, these stretched images together, I'm going to have a, um, a, a picture of the horse head that is... Uh, going to show the detail in the brightest uh, parts of the uh, uh, exposure. So I'm going to come, then I'm going to take exposures at 120 seconds, and that's going to bring out a lot more of the nebulosity uh, and show the horse head, but there's going to be some bright. Uh, areas, bright stars that are in this region that are going to be blown out, uh, oversaturated. So in post-processing, when I start working on the image, I'm going to uh, process all the images that I took at 120 seconds, and I'm going to process all the images that I took at 15 seconds, and then I'm going to use a process in PixInsight called High Dynamic Range Composition and HDR Composition and I'm going to blend these two together and when I do that I'll have a, uh, a representation of detail in the uh, brightest areas as well as detail in the uh, dark areas so when you combine the two, you increase the dynamic range of the image from one end of the luminosity scale to the other, from zero to 255. So that's a good thing, I hope. <laughs> We're hoping, fingers crossed. Wow, the guiding is going nuts over here. Um, these aren't dithers either, these are just spikes. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, I'm going to probably sign off in a few minutes and go outside, stop this, and uh, make sure I don't have any cables acting up. But before I do that, uh, cable management is extremely import important, and even more so when it gets cold, because the cables get stiff, and they can cause some drag on your uh, telescopes and it doesn't take much to cause uh, movement in your uh, in your guiding. As a matter of fact when cars go by that have those radios with the basses that are real loud they will uh, those uh, bass vibrations will move my telescope and you can see the bumps in the uh, in the graphs. <laughs> But you consider the fact that um, when you take these telescopes and you shoot them millions of miles into uh, space, the slightest movement will will uh, will be noticed. And so uh, it's kind of hold binoculars that uh, are hard to hold because they kind of your your target kind of shakes. Well, the same thing is happening here. But uh, this is unnatural. This is uh, this is bad stuff going on with guiding. So 
We're going to have to fix it. Uh, if we don't, we're at 116. It's been worse. Uh, maybe it'll settle down. We're at 110. But it's going to have to settle down or my stars will be crazy. What's really important in guiding is that these two numbers are close. Uh, they can be high and they can be low, but they need to be close. If this is 90 and this is 30, then my stars are going to be oblong. oblong. Uh, so if they're pretty close, then I can still have good round stars. And it's gotten a little crazy again. But part of that is the dithering that's going on. And dithering is an automatic movement of the telescope between images. It's a way to manage the noise that uh, images will accrue over long exposures. Thermal noise, primarily. Okay, let's head back and let's take a look at the stars on this this particular and let's see See how bright this booger is I wonder if it's overexposed. Let's take a look uh, We're going to bring up image statistics and we're going to click on that And I'm looking over here, sample. And it's at, uh, yeah, it's it's overexposed. Uh, the maximum is 65. Even at 15 seconds, I've overexposed this star. But uh, when you see what the 120 second seconds do, this thing is... Uh, like a bright light. This star, on the other hand, the maximum is only 16,000. So, okay guys, well let's uh, go back to our other kit and see how the Orion Nebula is going. Let's see how our guiding is going. It's not any better. It's at 122, so it might uh, just be that we're dealing with uh, scene conditions and uh, when this is my guide star right here scene will cause the guide star to move it's because you have some uncertainty and fluctuations in the atmosphere and so when you're trying to pinpoint the centroid of a star and it's moving around because of scene, it's impossible to keep it centered. So what happens is you have these unruly graphs that you can't do anything about. Uh, sometimes taking uh, longer exposures like four and five second exposures can uh, help you chase the poor scene conditions, but um, I would prefer to start out with fast exposures and see if I can get a handle on it that way. As long as we're around uh, one RMS, uh, give or take a few points either way, I'm okay. And uh, also as long as these two numbers are close, then I'm gonna have round stars. What happens if your RMS is like two or three, even though these are the same, your stars will be round, but they'll be bloated. So the ideal thing is to have like 20 and 20. Your stars are sharp, sharp and tight and round. But you can have ob oblong stars with an RMS of one or less if these two numbers are far apart. Look at here, that's nuts. But it's seen, and there ain't a whole lot I can do about it. I can't calibrate seeing conditions. Um, 
And I'm 99%, I know that's what it is because uh, I'm getting some okay guiding, uh, but I get these interruptions. I am going to check cables just to make sure on both of them, especially since it's getting cold. Let's see what it is outside. Let's, let's bring up our power box. And it's 40 degrees out right now. Uh, the dew point is 21.2. That's good. I'll bet we don't have dew tonight. Yeah. Okay. This is the temperature line, and this is the dew point. If these two intersect, you can count on water uh, gathering on, or dew gathering on your telescopes. Now, I have dew heaters set up, but uh, they're probably not turned on yet. They won't need to be. Yeah, they're not turned on at all because there's no threat of dew so far. We may not have any night. Let me double check that and go to the other kit and bring up that power box. Uh, that says we're down to 39 degrees. And uh, let's look at our, yeah. So temperature and our dew point are pretty far apart. They are coming close together, but it looks like they, they could, uh, maybe last the night so we may not have any dew tonight that'd be a good thing uh, again i have dew heaters on my telescopes and on my guide scopes so that uh, they heat up and that keeps dew from forming but uh, i still prefer uh, not to have to deal with that moisture Okay, folks, we have stuff going on. I don't know how good this stuff is going to do. My half-lux radius for uh, the Astro 2 camera, that's the Vixen with the one-shot color camera, is 1.93. Let's go back over and check the stats on this one. Well, we have a half flux radius of 2.32. Now, part of that has to do with these huge stars here. And these are massive uh, stars, as you will see in the final image. And uh, they, they have an effect because they're so large. Um, but I'm okay with that. And... I'll show you how blown out this is. We're at 65,504. We are, we are oversaturated already, even at 15 uh, seconds. Is that what I'm taking? Yeah, I think it is. Let me bring up the uh, yeah, 15 second exposures. I probably could have taken five second exposures for, uh, for these looms. At any rate, this is going to run until about midnight, and uh, then I'm going to uh, change filters, and I'm going to run narrowband imaging. Uh, the moon will have very little effect on the narrowband imaging, and I'm going to um, head to different targets and image until morning. This time of the year is the best time of the year for what I do because uh, I have darkness from 6.30 to 6.30. So I can get 12 hours of imaging in. In the summertime, the nights are short and I'm lucky if I get four hours of, clear, of uh, dark skies and imaging in. So I, I like this time of the year. My wife doesn't. I like the short, short days and the long nights. All righty, folks. I'm going to uh, leave you now. Uh, I may come back live when I switch targets later tonight. Uh, but I imagine you guys are going to be uh, uh, drawing some Z's 
and I don't blame you. Uh, don't forget if you don't. And I want to thank you for watching. Uh, have a happy uh, holiday season. I know uh, a lot's going on with a lot of you guys and um, uh, family coming in, mask being worn, mask not being worn, uh, vaccines, no vaccines, dealing with all the nuts, the stuff that's going on. But at any rate, uh, it's a great time of the year. We're blessed. Make sure you say something good to somebody and make their day and you'll make your day. Catch you later, clear skies.